You have a president who is a Roman Catholic. Today's a good day. And who is advocating the insanity at the third level of divine judgment as if this is normal. Same-sex marriage must be recognized as legal in every state in the nation. God is the author of marriage, not man. Therefore, God is the one who defines marriage, not man. Therefore, man does not have the right to introduce the concept of same-sex marriage. Number one, because by definition, it's not marriage, it's another thing. And number two, because by definition, it goes against what was created in Genesis chapter 2. The teaching in Genesis chapter 2 that gave us marriage between a man and a woman for the purposes of procreation, illustration, and sanctification. He also made it very clear that what God has joined together, man cannot separate. Reflecting on societal changes, you mentioned that when you first moved to this country as a Christian teenager, there was a sense of morality and a consensus on certain truths. However, you feel that this consensus has diminished. Morality seems to be fading from schools, universities, and even some, even some evangelical churches, which now advocate for homosexual and transgender rights. Today, I sign the Respect for Marriage Act into law. <laughs> Deciding whether to marry, who to marry, is one of the most profound decisions a person can make. And as I've said before, and some of you might remember, on a certain TV show 10 years ago. <laughs> Marriage is between a man and a woman, and states must respect that. Why do we need a constitutional amendment? Marriage is between a man and a woman. What's the game going on here? I got in trouble. Huh? <laughs> This shift is concerning to those who uphold traditional biblical teachings and see these changes as a departure from what they believe to be God's design for marriage and morality. This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Genesis 2, 23, 24 SV. This scripture emphasizes the foundational belief in marriage between a man and a woman as a divine institution. Many Christians hold this view and are concerned about the changes in societal norms that seem to move away from these traditional values. One, rejection of God, humanity's initial step is rejecting God, humanity's initial step is rejecting God and his truths. Two, sexual revolution. This rejection leads to a sexual Revolution where natural relations are abandoned. Three, homosexual revolution. This is followed by a homosexual revolution, as described in verses 26 and 27, four. Depraved mind, finally, God gives them over to a depraved mind. Finally, God gives them over to a depraved or reprobate mind, as stated in verse 28, the Greek that is non-functioning or morally corrupt. Mr. President, this is my 221st day of publicly transitioning. God, and, I love it. Uh, thank you. I am extremely privileged to live in a state that allows me access to the resources I need, and that decision is just between me and my doctors. It's a kind of insanity, and, and it's an insanity that is such an insanity, it, it begs the issue of reason to even think people would do this. The reason people are doing it is because they are under divine judgment. God has let them have a reprobate mind. So when you see all of this transgender activity and when you see them want to make laws to protect transgender identity and you know it is absolute and total and utter insanity, you know we've reached the reprobate mind. People can't think reasonably, which means there's no way back to sanity. There's no way back. We continue to speak out about the basic fundamental rights of all human beings. It's outrageous and I think it's immoral. The trans part's not immoral. And because it is a divine judgment on them, God doesn't interrupt the course of their thinking down this path of sexual revolution, homosexual revolution, to the kind of insanity that we see with transgenderism. Marriage, I mean this involved my heart, marriage is a simple proposition. Who do you love? 
And will you be loyal with that person you love? It's not more complicated than that. The other thing is that all legal decisions are based on principles and established precedent. And right now the principle is, you know, sort of the, the Beatles mentality. All you need is love. Mm-hmm. Well, if that's the case, you, you, if marriage is based on popular opinion and who loves each other, the 50 year old man and the 12 year old boy, the man and his daughter, mm-hmm. um, so on and so forth. And everybody say, Oh, red herring. No, not once the principle is established. So this is not private right, right. and it doesn't stop here. The law recognizes that everyone should have the right to answer those questions for themselves without the government interference. But also secures the federal rights, protections that come with marriage. Therefore, God gave them over. This spells out what this wrath is. God gave them over. Now remember, this is historic. This is not looking at the future. This is looking at history. God gave them past tense over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. When this wrath goes into place, the first thing you will see is a sexual revolution. When God abandons a culture, you will see them sink to a low level of lust and impurity and the dishonoring of their bodies. The first thing that happens when a nation is under judgment is a sexual revolution. Verse 25 says, reminding us why it happened, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So look back to 1970, 1980, and remember when the sexual revolution began. That was step one in the abandonment of this society by God Himself. Like when your loved one gets sick and you've legally recognized as a next of kin, for most of our nation's history, we denied interracial couples and same-sex couples from these protections. Being homosexual is not the same thing as being black or being white or being whatever. It's not the same thing. It's not an immutable characteristic. And nobody has proven otherwise. There is zero, zero biological evidence that there is an immutable characteristic. If there was biological evidence, then you could prove that somebody was homosexual after they died. All you have to do is do an autopsy. You just do a postmortem, go into the brain and find that area in the brain that, that, that homosexuals have. Wait, wait, what? Nothing in the brain? Okay, well, go into the genes and find the gene. To, oh, wait, I think that's nothing in the genes? Well, uh, I heard about a pheromone study. You go into the pheromone. Oh, really? That was not. Huh. There's absolutely nothing, nothing that proves that there is such a thing as a person who is a homosexual. There are people who practice homosexuality, but there is nothing in the world, nothing that demonstrates that there is a class or category of people who are immutably and unchangeably homosexuals, just like I'm immutably and unchangeably a black person. It doesn't exist, although the majority of you out there believe that it does because you've been told over and over and over and over again. You hear so many stories. I've known all my life. I knew it when I was a little boy. I knew it when I was a little girl. No, you didn't. You weren't even, you didn't even have sexual thoughts of those kind when you were a little boy or a little girl. You didn't even develop sexually back then. How could you possibly have known about your sexual orientation? That's a ridiculous lie. And we let people get away with it all the time. All the time. We shouldn't. We shouldn't. Today, we celebrate our progress. From Hawaii, the first state to declare that denying marriage of same-sex couples is unconstitutional, to Massachusetts, the first state to legalize marriage equality for couples like Gina and Heidi who just, you just heard from. My son, Bo Biden, who was Attorney General of the state of Delaware, who filed an amicus brief with the Supreme Court in favor of marriage equality and pushed to add gender identity protections into the law as well. What you see in our country is the unfolding of the judgment of God in Romans chapter 1. So mark it down. There is no group of senators or congressmen or anybody else who is going to reverse this. This is not reversible. 
This is divine judgment. The fact of the matter is we're in this world, although we're not of this world. The fact of the matter is the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. Mm -hmm. And we don't take the truth and hide it under a bushel. Mm -hmm. That's not the church. We don't live these completely separate sort of bifurcated lives um, that we are the light of the world. We are the salt that preserves. And so it, it, it's just completely, it, it's unconceivable that we would not speak. The concept of a depraved mind is used to illustrate a state where individuals are no longer able to discern or follow what is right. The reference to a man thinking he is a woman is presented as an example of this distorted thinking. This interpretation reflects a traditional biblical view on morality and the consequences of turning away from God's design. It is often used to explain contemporary issues within the framework of biblical teachings on human behavior and divine judgment. Many older people in America grew up during America, grew up during America, grew up during a time when there was what can be described as cultural Christianity. During this period, there was a general Christian consensus. People understood the church, the Bible, the gospel, and the morality derived from biblical teachings. This cultural Christianity was sometimes referred to as the Judeo-Christian ethic. In this context, being part of a church was socially beneficial. For example, in the South, joining a church could help you get a job or connect with others, making you socially acceptable and seen as one of the good guys. This association with church and religion was seen as a positive trait and was beneficial for social and professional connections. The founders of America, while not all adhering strictly to the God of the Bible, believed that a belief in some divine authority was necessary to maintain moral order. They created a concept of God to encourage morality among the people. This belief in God was often defined primarily by the Bible, leading to a kind of cultural morality that persisted in America for a long time.